We turned over everything that was work-related, every single thing. Personal stuff, we did not. I had no obligation to do so and did not. And all I can tell you is that I turned over every work-related email in uh, my possession. What we turned over were more than 30,000 emails that I assumed were already in the government system, Brett, because they were sent to state.gov addresses. Sure, but there were some that were just recently discovered and turned over. No, that was in the State Department, not in me. Okay. I've turned over everything. Let me just... My emails are so boring. Yeah. And, I mean, I'm, I'm embarrassed about that. They're so yeah. boring. And <laughs> so we've already released, I don't know, 30,000 plus. So what's a few more? What's a few more? Well, there are many more, thousands more, and they are dealing, excuse me, they're dealing with things that are clearly not personal, including Benghazi and the Clinton Foundation. Uh, and we are finding this out day after day. This is the New York Times, uh, usually a clear supporter of a Democratic candidate, especially in this case, uh, writes this editorial from the editorial board about the ties to the Clinton Foundation. When Mrs. Clinton became Secretary of State, the Obama administration tried to draw a line between the foundation, particularly its foreign government sponsors and her role. The new emails underscore that this effort was at best partly successful. The Clinton Foundation has become a symbol of the Clinton's laudable ambitions, but also of their tangled alliances and operation uh, operational opacity. If Mrs. Clinton wins, it could prove a target for her political adversaries. Achieving true distance from the foundation is not only necessary to ensure its effectiveness, it is an ethical imperative for Mrs. Clinton. So with that, we'll bring in the panel. Jonah Goldberg, senior editor at National Review. A.B. Stoddard, associate editor at Real Clear Politics. And Cheryl Atkinson, anchor of Sinclair's Full Measure. Jonah, okay, so, you know, you listen to that tape and one after another, I turned everything over. Yeah, well, if you go back and you go to her initial press conference at the UN, she had this granite facade of a cover story. And the facts that have come out since then have not only just pounded it to rubble, it's got grounded into like a fine paste. There's literally not a single factual assertion she made since back then that hasn't been proven to be a demonstrable lie. And the, the amazing thing, I mean, at some point you think she'd just want to fire her lawyers, because they were the ones who said that they'd gone through everything with a fine tooth comb, they read every indivi individual email, turns out all of that wasn't true either. You know, the one thing that I haven't been able to find are any emails about yoga. You would think that like if, if there are all these tens of thousands of emails that were deleted that were about yoga, some of those might have surfaced, but no, it's only the ones about Benghazi and the foundation and all these things. It, 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 if she wins, this will haunt her administration far worse than Whitewater ever did her husband. And you know, People overlook the fact that there was testimony here under oath to Congress in which she said some of these things, these very things that have demonstrably proven to be false. Right. Um, Jonah's right. So many things she said a year ago, but even that day, that Benghazi testimony in the 11 hours last October, she said, I remember that day, she said something that the State Department captured between 90 and 95 percent of her emails. And the State Department had to come out in the next week and say that they didn't know where that number came from, that that wasn't true. She has um, obviously brought this on herself. Um, I think what she probably thought was legalese that would protect her were actually a bunch of lies. They've all been proven wrong. Now it's not just another shoe to drop, it's raining shoes, and Democrats are terrified about what's going to be coming out this week and the end of September uh, in the days and weeks before the election. And it seems like the Benghazi emails are especially egregious because they're so, you know, after all this investigation into Benghazi, to hear that there are at least 30, maybe more Benghazi emails. Well, and I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for those in 2012. Still hasn't been filled. It's been, what, four years? Those should be coming to me, but they're not. So that's yet another example of violation of freedom of information law at the very least. Um, I also think that you know, when, when she's talking about separating herself from the Clinton Foundation, just to bridge over there for just a moment, if the New York Times is right and there really are these troubled entanglements, how does the separation now really solve that problem if she were to become president? The question is, that's water under the bridge where she's already taken money from, through the foundation from domestic and foreign interests that she will be making decisions about if she's president of the United States, and I'm not sure how, how logical it is to say separation now would even solve that. Is it significant, Jonah, that the New York Times editorial board is out with this, you got to break free of this thing because it's hurting you're going to screw this whole thing up. 
Yeah, no, I, I think it is significant, and that's one of the reasons that made me think of Whitewater, is that people forget, New York Times sort of led on Whitewater in the early part of the first Clinton administration. This is the kind of issue that the New York Times is sort of genetically incapable of ignoring, this sort of pay-for-play, uh, behind-the-scenes uh, access selling. And I think what they're warning her is, is look, you know, we think you're going to win, but if you don't drop this, we're going to hound you to death on this. And it's a sign of how everybody, every Democrat I talk to says they're just terrified about what more is going to come out because Hillary clearly seemed to think that these emails wouldn't be coming out. And the Chelsea still staying at the head almost kind of rubs it in some, some people's faces. Oh, it's unbelievable. Uh, Democrats are on the record, along with all these editor editorial boards across the country, saying you absolutely have to shut it or just merge it into another foundation so that the work can be, the donations can be collected somewhere else, the work can be done somewhere else, detached from the Clinton family, at least for four or eight years. And then they announced right after that that, oh, even though they're going to stop taking foreign and corporate donations when she's president, they should talk, stop taking them now. But Chelsea's going to stay, and actually the Clinton Health Access Initiative, their biggest project, will still be taking foreign money. Yeah, there's a question of what a separation really would mean. You know, you could say you're separated, but what does that mean? But I think the public, they're counting on the public to have this tired, weary feeling, the drip drip about the emails and the Clinton Foundation. Who's paying that close attention besides us and people maybe watching this show? But I would say the vast majority of people aren't in that deep and they just hear it and they, they sort of tune it out. And I think they're counting on that. All right, uh, I want to turn quickly to uh, the Trump campaign and the speech coming up tomorrow on immigration. Here is uh, Jason Miller, a spokesperson for uh, Donald Trump. What you've seen with Mr. Trump is he's been remarkably consistent in his pledge to end illegal immigration. We're going to build a wall. We're going to secure our borders. We're going to enforce our immigration laws. We're going to end right. sanctuary cities. We're going to pass E-Verify. We're going to uphold the Constitution. That's going to make a big difference in this country. I guess there's just a lot of people, Jonah, who's, who have seen an evolution, and the Trump campaign itself says, you know, wait till the speech. Yeah, and we should. Let's wait till the speech. I mean, earlier this week, we heard some trial balloons that it may not actually be a real wall. It may be a digital or virtual wall, which sounds even more Jeb Bush-like. Maybe the Mexicans will pay for this hologram. Who knows? Um, I think that the... Uh, uh, the problem, uh, the gamble they're making is that the base isn't going to leave him for anything, and he needs a lot more than his base. And this is essentially a, what my colleague Ramesh Panuru calls a ricochet pander, where he's trying to sound nicer on things like immigration and minorities in order to attract essentially more college-educated whites, particularly college-educated women. Uh, Cheryl Mammoth, Pennsylvania poll out today. Uh, Clinton with a 48 percent to 40 percent uh, in the four-way race. Other state polls seem to be tightening a bit, uh, some national polls tightening as well, but the trend is that Clinton has a bit of a lead, uh, but it may be softer than it once was after the convention. And I agree with Jonah. Um, obviously, the Trump campaign is looking to see where it can pick up some new voters with appeal to minorities, with discussion maybe softening the immigration stance. And I agree with you when you said even if he softens on immigration, the people that want him to be tighter aren't going to go vote for Hillary Clinton. So the question is whether they lose their enthusiasm and don't come out and vote at all, because that's where he stands to really uh, surprise the projections and confound all the polls even. If there's a huge turnout of non-voters, and by that I mean people that haven't voted in a long time, normally don't vote, but are so enthused that they might come out to vote and that this wouldn't show up in the polls ahead of time, will those people be discouraged? 